God, you spoke and your word became flesh, breathing a new song of joy and praise into the world. Grant that we may bear the good news of your salvation, proclaiming your promise of peace to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. So earlier today when I logged on to Facebook, I saw a post by a colleague asking, how long is your sermon? <laughs> now, the post linked to an article titled from the Washington Post, Does Your Pastor Preach Too Long? A new survey shows the dramatic differences in sermons. Pew Research analyzed over 50,000 sermons to find the average length was 37 minutes. Is that not okay? Are we not looking for 37 minutes? Although, mainline, it's okay. I'm not going to preach for 37 minutes, I promise. It's okay. Mainline Protestants, it's just 25. That's okay too, right? That's like twice as long as my normal sermon. So I was like, oh, I got to get to work for tonight. I need to stop. No, I didn't do that. I promise. But in fact, this night is kind of a hard time for preachers in some ways because it focuses on a part of the Christian story we know so well, right? And I'd wager most of us have at some point probably been a shepherd or an angel in a pageant or maybe Mary or Joseph even. And I think one of the ways that we preachers can get in trouble is that we feel like we have to preach to a certain amount of time, perhaps, or that we try to say something new right? But I think that isn't really our job. As often as not, especially when we're talking about well-known passages of Scripture, our job isn't to find a novel thing to say, but rather invite those gathered to remember what they already know. So I don't pretend to have anything particularly new to say tonight, but I do hope that our time together invites you to lean into the story of Jesus' birth and to let it And all it means for us, remind us of why we gather on nights like this. That being said, I'm going to begin by doing something I never would have imagined thought possible. I'm going to quote a Will Ferrell movie in a sermon. I don't know how many of you know who Will Ferrell is. He is this gentleman here. Right? Um, You you might know him from the seven years he spent on Saturday Night Live in the mid-90s. This is Will Ferrell from that time. So ringing the cowbell, right? Yeah, yeah, cowbell. So I should have given a cowbell up to our percussionist up there. That would have been a good moment. But then he was in a movie after that called Talladega Nights, so where he plays Ricky Bobby, right? So this is Ricky Bobby. Okay. Now Ricky Bobby was a race car driver, as you can tell from the picture. He was a great NASCAR driver, in fact, and he was trying to stay number one. That's kind of the theme of the movie, what it's about. Towards the beginning of it, there's a scene in which Ricky and his friend Cal and his family gather around the table for dinner. The table's full of various kinds of fast food, and Ricky begins to pray in an indistinct southern accent, and I'm not even going to try to, to, to imitate it. And what follows is edited for both length and content, so to be clear. But Ricky Bobby begins and says, Dear Lord Baby Jesus, or as our brothers in the South call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family, my two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR as we call him. Dear Lord Baby Jesus, we also thank you for my wife, Father Chip, and we hope that you use your Baby Jesus powers to heal him in his leg. Dear Tiny Infant Jesus, and then his wife interjects. She stops him and she says, Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby all the time. And Ricky responds, Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whatever you want. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? And then he goes on later. Okay, dear eight-pound, six-ounce, newborn infant Jesus. (laughs) Don't even know a word yet. Just a little infant. So cuddly, but still omnipotent. That's good theology there. (laughs) Also, due to a binding endorsement contract that stipulates I mentioned Powerade at each grace, I just want to say thank you say that Powerade is delicious and cools you off on a hot summer day. And we look forward to Powerade's release of Mystic Mountain Blueberry, ending with thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby God, amen. 
It's a funny scene. But I also think it gets something profoundly right. Many of us, even if we wouldn't be as crass about it as Ricky Bobby, we do prefer the baby Jesus, the Christmas Jesus. There's something easy about that image of the baby in the arms and the light shining forth. We, we prefer thinking about that night with the angels and shepherd finding the child. We revel in the nostalgia that comes with the Christmas Eve services we share and the familiar hymns we've been singing all night. Have you ever noticed that most of the pictures of Jesus' birth make the scene look so peaceful? Here's one I found, right? Like everything looks just perfect, right? There's this one, another one. You can't see the light even coming from the baby Jesus, right, into the scene. I know you can't see it well in the choir. I'll show you pictures later, I promise. Or here's, here's one that I like too. This is when the shepherds actually find Jesus. And you can really see the light coming off the baby in this one, right? But I, I think most of us who've had children know that the birth of a child isn't so neat, isn't so, so clean as that, right? And there's nothing wrong with these pictures. In fact, they're reminders for us of the significance of the moment. They help to draw, help to draw us in, help us appreciate how utterly profound it is that God chose to come into the world in this way. It's why the artists choose to make the light flow out of the child in the image. That they, they meant are meant to remind us that the divine breaks into the world in such a surprising place as a young child, and that invite us to see the awe of that moment. But I think we also have to remember that the way these images do that is they don't focus on the fact that Jesus was born in a place that was probably pretty dirty and messy. And the clothes his parents were wearing probably didn't look anything like they did in those pictures, so neat, right? Or even so blue, right? That was an expensive dye. They're probably also pretty dirty and worn after a long trip worn by parents who probably didn't have very much. By the time Jesus was born, I'm sure his parents were exhausted from the travel, from not finding a place to even rest very easily, and then from a birth. And so I think for our part, we need to remember both aspects of this night, to stand in awe at the beauty and miraculousness of the Incarnation, even as we refuse to forget that these were humble and poor people who couldn't even find an inn to sleep in. There's even more recent depictions of the nativity which challenge us to sort of hold intention, right? That this wasn't such an easy thing to hold. It shouldn't just make us comfortable. This is a picture of cages, right? Thinking about Jesus' immigrants and things that are happening in our own country. And it's a provocative image and meant to be so. Right? It should challenge us. Because this is a story that shouldn't just give us comfort. It should challenge us to wonder about what it means to be people in places of power and privilege and what it means that Jesus came to those who were anything but that. I think we can't forget that the reason we celebrate Christmas has to do with not just the child, but who the child grew to be. We can't forget that we celebrate Christmas because he shared the good news of God's redeeming love for the whole world. We can't forget that we celebrate Christmas because Jesus had the audacity to talk with sinners and tax collectors. We can't forget that we celebrate Christmas because he upset those in power by proclaiming God's love for those society had cast aside. We can't forget that we celebrate Christmas because he went to the cross and died that we might know what love would look like. We can't forget we celebrate Christmas because it eventually leads to the resurrection and the Easter to come. If Christmas is to mean anything for us, we can't forget that it's an invitation to know and to love not just Jesus as a child, 
But Jesus is God made man. The same Jesus who taught us that loving our neighbor is not just about loving the people who live near us, but loving even those people we're supposed to hate. That's the whole point of that window, which you can't see very well right now, but is over there where Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? The Samaritans, shockingly, the neighbor to the Jew. When we celebrate Jesus' incarnation, we have to be willing to see past the glory of the moment to recognize how it invites us to live more fully as God dreams for us to each and every day in response to that ripple that happened as a consequence of God coming into the world in that particular way. Writing about this mystery of incarnation, David Lose asks, what does the incarnation really mean? Yes, of course, always it means that God chose to enter into our humanity in all of its fullness and foibles, its power and pain, its joys and sorrows. Yes, of course, it means that God would even experience death itself only to defeat its determined grip on our lives and turn it into eternal life. But what does it really mean for us, here and now and today, beyond the truth of Jesus of Nazareth and the promise of an empty tomb? The Incarnation means that at the same time, the Incarnation is a revelation of God. It's also a revelation of who we are. We begin to realize that in God's decision to become human, that our humanity matters. We begin to recognize that in God's commitment to bodies, that our bodies matter. We begin to remember that in God's determination to be known in the flesh means that doing ministry in the flesh matters. Tonight, friends, we celebrate God becoming man. And by doing so, God inviting us to be more than we could ever be on our own. Tonight, we stand in awe that God loves us so much He would choose to come into the world in a manger, surrounded not by the powerful, but by the lowly. And so this Christmas, I hope you enjoy the chance to remember the story of Jesus' birth in its fullness. If you have children or grandchildren, I hope you take the time to read them the story of Christ's birth as a part of your holiday traditions. And I hope we take the time to marvel at the choice God made to walk with us. And more than anything else, I hope we remember that we come here today not only to glory at the nativity, but at all that would come after. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.